Great. Uh, thank you so much for the kind intro and uh, what a fantastic uh, amount of content in the workshop today. So thank you very much to the organizers. Um, well, look, I'm, I'm really excited here to pick up the narrative around end-to-end -end deep learning for autonomous driving. And in fact, the workshop topic today on scalability for autonomous driving is, is really close to my heart because it motivates uh, pretty much everything we do at WAVE. So at WAVE, we're really trying to uh, take the industry from the bottom left in this matrix to the top right. Uh, we think the future is, is with machine learning for autonomous driving to be able to deal with the complexities of the, um, and the high dimensionality of the data that, uh, that, that you find in driving domains. I think it's fair to say that, uh, that, that the industry today is, is largely in the bottom left with geographic jurisdictions, uh, weather or environmental or behavioral um, jurisdictions that restrict the operation of, of these vehicles. Now, um, I worry that the industry is not gonna be able to move to the bottom right. I think it might, be, uh, it, it might be too hard for humanity to be able to come up with a rule-based system that can deal with the complexity of driving. I think it's also fair to say that at the moment we're in the top left. So we've put together uh, some initial evidence towards machine learning for self-driving. And what I'd like to show you today is, uh, is I, I think the next chapter in this journey towards the top right. And I think that's, uh, that, that's the future. I think we'll likely see that uh, robotics will be just like what we've seen last century in computer vision, speech recognition, uh, natural language processing, and even game playing agents with uh, deep learning eclipsing human level performance uh, and becoming very efficient at solving these problems with data. Uh, and so that's really what we'll be focusing on in, in the talk today. Now, why, uh, why is this necessary? Well, a very recent example, uh, here are some photos taken today in London. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll notice that the footpath in London has actually been extended to, uh, to allow social distancing due to the coronavirus pandemic. I think this is a really good example for why, uh, why we're well motivated to look at machine learning solutions for self-driving. If you, uh, if you try and re resolve this problem by, uh, in a rule-based system by, for example, adjusting your high definition map, let's say you might delete the lane or adjust the lane uh, for this protrusion from the, uh, from, from the footpath. Uh, or perhaps you put in a rule-based system that says, if pandemic, uh, watch out for these, uh, these footpath extensions. I really think you're missing the point and perhaps uh, you know, building too much generalization debt in the system. When we think about data efficiency for learning, it's not just dealing with new edge cases or generalizing to new geographies. Um, it's not just getting that deployed, but it's, it's actually maintaining the system once it's deployed. How do we deal with the cultural shifts due to driving when roads become proliferated with autonomous vehicles? You know, there's a constant distribution shift and that's why uh, I'm betting that data efficiency, if you can build a data efficient learning system, um, that's what's gonna unlock self-driving at scale for society. Uh, and I think deep learning is the way to do it. Internally at Wave, we talk a lot about this metric called the graph of autonomy. And this is a graph of performance versus data. And I think really epitomizes uh, this desire to be data efficient and to learn very quickly to deal with new data to be performant at scale. So to start this talk, I'm going to uh, give a quick deep dive into the framework that we use for end-to-end -end deep learning for autonomous driving. Hopefully this uh, paints a, a, a picture that's, that's clear about this approach. And then I'd like to give a, a bit of wider context in this work and then uh, finally finish with some new results uh, from our team over the last year. So what does end-to-end -end deep learning for autonomous driving mean? Well, for us, it's about learning a function that maps the input state uh, X through to the output action space Y. And in driving, um, well, we, we use about a, a 10 to the power of eight, about 100 million dimensional input state. And this is uh, six monocular cameras around the vehicle running at about 15 Hertz. They're each about one to two megapixels, so one to two million pixels. And then there's some other lower dimensional signals like GPS, sat nav, or, or vehicle state. And these add up to about 10 to the eight dimensions, especially when you consider the time dimension as well of these signals. And then the output action space is only 10 to the one dimensions in that order. And so there's quite a large um, mapping uh, through, through, these eight, uh, uh, through these eight powers of 10 down to the output action space where we need to output a motion plan for both lateral and longitudinal control of the vehicle, speed and steering, uh, as well as vehicle controls, things like indicators and headlights. But of course, learning this uh, from just input and output alone uh, is, is likely to be very data inefficient. So we can introduce, introduce a number of inductive biases into our network, um, some intermediate representations that we know very well in computer vision, 
uh, are likely to be beneficial for driving things like semantics, motion, geometry, from segmentation to um, scene flow to bird's eye view of, of geometric structure or future prediction. I think the important thing to, to mention though is that although these are intermediate representations that are human interpretable and good for us to understand how the network behaves, they're unlikely to be the optimal intermediate representation for a machine. Therefore, they're not the intermediate state of this model. This model doesn't pass through them. Instead, uh, we still maintain a high dimensional latent state. Uh, let's call it 10 to the power of four dimensions, but we need to be able to decode to these states. By decoding to these human interpretable representations, it means that we're able to get evidence that our higher dimensional representation, which we can't understand, contains this information, um, which is, is, is likely necessary, but not sufficient for driving. And that's an important distinction. So how do you train this model? Well, we've explored a number of different learning signals at WAVE, uh, and I'm listing, uh, I'm listing all of them here. And, and these signals uh, you can use to varying degrees of, of ability on varying types of data to be able to learn a driving policy. And I, I think really the crux of getting a, a data efficient fleet learning system is really understanding the complementary nature of these different signals and how to construct a unified curriculum of them all, uh, which is something I think as humans, we do very well. Um, we do everything from uh, observe states with driving to uh, playing video games um, to, to actually getting direct supervision from a driving instructor. So what are they? The first one is uh, direct beha behavioral cloning from an expert policy data. Uh, so this is direct supervised learning from human driving to do imitation learning. We can also drive the vehicle autonomously and on policy and use the, the fact that the safety driver intervenes as a negative reinforcement signal. And then when the safe driver intervenes, we can also use the actual uh, corrective action that's demonstrated as supervised learning signal. Uh, we can view the future states in a self-supervised manner uh, to, to learn future prediction. And of course, there are many intermediate computer vision representations we can learn with either self-supervised or supervised learning. And then finally, simulation is a really rich signal uh, for um, pre predominantly direct supervision uh, where we can create off-policy states that are either too dangerous or um, too expensive to collect in the real world. All of these are very complementary learning signals that can come together to form a very um, compelling learning system. And that's what we're building at WAVE. We're building a very large scale fleet learning loop uh, with our fleet going out to collect hundreds of terabytes a day of both on policy data of our, of, our, um, of, of our autonomous model driving and also expert policy data of humans driving and ingesting this at scale in addition to simulation to form a fleet learning loop. And I think this is, this is really exciting because our fleet learning loop, I think uh, can be data efficient enough to be really the key to unlock self-driving. Um, if this is something that we, uh, we crank it at scale from deploying models to the road, actually collecting data both from the virtual fleet, uh, driving them autonomously on policy or off policy and filtering and understanding this data, ingesting it, storing it and developing curriculum between all those learning signals I said before, and then doing deep learning at cloud scale with connected compute, uh, evaluating these systems, simulating them, understanding their metrics and using that to guide this in a big active learning loop I think this is what's really gonna drive data efficiency and how we can scale to the both new distributions and shifting distributions uh, of our urban driving worlds. That was the framework. So now I'd like to share uh, a bit of context because there's been some, some really pioneering work uh, that is, is, is important to really uh, reference here. Uh, and I think we're seeing a trend where this, uh, I think this approach is, is perhaps, uh, like I said before, going to do what computer vision, speech, NLP did in, in last decade in robotics. And I think, uh, I think we're seeing it delayed, um, robotics is delayed due to these other fields because it's inherently harder to get access to the data in, an, in, you know, in a robotic sense because of the safety or practical um, reasons of doing so. But having said that, this, uh, you know, these approaches have actually been around for a while. In 1989 was the uh, first time that we saw a machine learning approach to self-driving. Now, the interesting thing here, the system was developed in Carnegie Mellon University in the east of the United States. And I understand the reason why it was uh, they were motivated to pursue a learning-based approach was because they wanted to deal with and generalize to the west coast of the United States. And the classical methods at the time, uh, mostly around lane detection and edge detection, couldn't do that. So this was really pioneering work that's inspired uh, a lot of what we do today. And then in 2016, NVIDIA uh, came out with, I guess, a modern rendition of that work, taking it to AlexNet style uh, deep learning and, develop, and demonstrating really robust lane following across some, some pretty drastic changes in appearance from sun terrain to even snow with a, a novel geometric warping uh, 
method for data augmentation. Um, although this was only for steering control of the vehicle and uh, no speed control at the time. Then in 2008, uh, one of the first things we did was show that you could apply reinforcement learning on a real life vehicle online. Now at the time, we'd only really seen reinforcement learning learning over tens of millions of data points in simulation for things like Atari games. And showing that we could learn to lane follow with just 10 episodes of feedback uh, was, was quite an exciting step for us at least. Um, 2018, again, we saw a, uh, a, a really awesome breakthrough from Intel showing not only lane following like we've seen in the previous three works, but now actually being able to do conditional imitation learning and condition on a Manhattan style left, right, straight turn to go and actually navigate. And I think this, is, uh, this really took it to the next level and they demonstrated this actually in closed loop on a toy vehicle. Uh, then later that year, uh, we saw ETH Zurich develop a, uh, a system that's able to actually localize from a map, not just Manhattan turns, but do more generalized autonomy. And uh, I want to call out two works here, one from ETH uh, who showed it in an open loop setting, and then the next year followed on from MIT being able to show it in closed loop. And this I think was, was really key because it, it's taken it from lane following to uh, Manhattan style navigation, and now to more generalized navigation through the complex roads that we see um, in, our, in our urban areas. So again, really great work. And then in 2019, uh, we've seen simulation being able to use, uh, being able to be used to train models, uh, train models in simulation and then deploy them in the real world. So a sim to real uh, situation. What we were able to show in WAVE was training a system in our internal simulator and deploying it in the real world in a zero shot setting. So no new real world label training data, just non-corresponding arbitrary real world images and showing that we could um, uh, drive in the real world uh, for over three kilometers. Although this only uh, considered the static world, so it could only navigate without traffic. And I think uh, I'm still really excited to see uh, some sim real work that can drive in dynamic worlds. Uh, again, last year we saw a, another piece of work from Uber. Uh, Uber ATG was able to show that we could go from a LiDAR and HD map state to actually do motion planning. And I was really excited to see in this work that um, that there was the interpretability of understanding uh, where, where vehicles were detected, and then also understanding the multimodal behavior of them, uh, which is really important when you start to, to consider traffic interaction. And then finally, uh, last year, this was published um, uh, earlier this year at ICRA, uh, we were able to, at WAVE, show that we could drive in urban environments and traffic, doing full speed and steering control of the autonomous vehicle. And you can see here in the video, it's slowing down, giving away to this traffic, and it's conditional imitation learning on multiple camera inputs. So that was a very quick uh, whirlwind through where end-to-end -end learning has gone. And what I think is uh, best to take away from that is I think, you know, really a exciting culmination of many years of ideas are now starting to become available because of the access of data, of vehicle platforms and maturity of autonomous driving. And, and I think this, uh, you know, I think this trend is, 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 is really gonna be reinforced um, in the coming years. So let me talk, uh, let me move on to talking about the future. What's next? I think what's left to be desired from this work to date is really the behavioral complexity of these models and moving testing towards a, a larger scale because we really yet to see robustness, the kind of thing that uh, makes these systems, intelligent mobile systems, uh, allows humans to trust them and actually benefit from them in society. So let me show you uh, some work that I want to thank all of the team at WAVE who have who've really, um, really behind this work and, and I want to share a glimpse of some of the things that we've been putting together over the last year. So here's our system driving in London. We've been using London as largely as our uh, driving school. We've been learning to drive from data at scale and, and some of you may recognize these landmarks but I'm going to give you a very brief tour through London um, of our system autonomously driving. Here you can see it's crossing a bridge and approaching Big Ben. And, uh, and Westminster. Now here you can see it driving up to Buckingham Palace. And one of the things you'll notice in these videos is that London is a really, I think this is true in a lot of, um, a lot of European cities, it's a really complex driving environment. It's not as well structured as you see as on some of the highways in, in, uh, in more modern cities or places like, uh, like, uh, like the driving demos we've seen in, in Arizona in the United States, but it's quite unstructured. And this makes it challenging because you can't just set up invisible railway tracks from a HD map and follow those you need to adapt to the affordances that are given by the, uh, the roadworks or the people or the vehicles around you. Um, and I think this is, is, these are good examples of this. Here's us crossing Tower Bridge uh, or coming up to St. Paul's Cathedral all in central London. 
But going beyond uh, the, I guess, the tourist um, tour of London that I just gave you, uh, here's, here's some more behavioral examples that, uh, that we can show. These are some examples of our system driving through traffic light scenarios. And you might be surprised that, to, to, to understand, but I want to point out why this is a difficult one to solve from a machine learning perspective. Traffic lights are challenging because you have to com combine both a low dimensional, uh, sorry, a, a low frequency and a high frequency signal. You know, the color of the light is a very high frequency component of the image. Um, but then you need to also understand the sort of more global scene context, which is a low frequency signal. And uh, these can be very difficult to, to combine. You can imagine the basic encoder network, uh, something like what we've seen from image recognition, will struggle to deal with the high frequency. Um, but then a, you know, a more attentive model might struggle to deal with the um, actual scene context that you need for things like when you have asynchronous lanes going into that traffic light with you know, colored arrows for the different lanes and these kind of things. Uh, and of course, it's also important to realize, and anyone who's worked on these problems will know that this is not just a binary red, green, stop, go rule, but there is a long distribution of edge cases. So learning a high dimensional machine learning representation for this is, is challenging. Um, but here's some examples of our system driving in London through traffic light scenarios. Now let's move on to roundabout scenarios. Uh, these may be foreign to some of you uh, in North America, but they're everywhere in London. And they're quite challenging to drive through because they require a complex multi-agent interaction. They're, they're similar to a merge scenario. And, uh, and they also have a very difficult uh, navigational command. How do you represent, in a machine learning sense, how do you represent take the second exit? Um, do you really want to encode that command uh, with an RNN from a natural language perspective? Or do you want to rely on memory or GPS or road sign recognition? I think uh, you know, there are many ways you could do it, but uh, actually representing uh, the navigational instruction through roundabouts, especially when you have multi-lanes and, and multi-exits, it can be quite challenging. And so here's some examples of us uh, driving through some roundabouts in London. And what about roadworks? Well, I think these are the, uh, one of the holy grails for challenges because they're quite, uh, we're super unstructured and they require deviations from normal road structure. I mean, look at the middle example. In this, uh, in this video, we have to drive on the wrong side of the road. In the UK, we drive on the left, and in here, we have to deviate to the right-hand side of the road um, controlled by a traffic signal. And so uh, these scenarios can be, can be exceptionally challenging. And here you, uh, you can see our system able to, to successfully navigate uh, roadwork scenarios that it hasn't encountered in training. Now, what about simulation? Well, I mentioned at the start that it was a very powerful learning signal, and uh, I feel very lucky to work with a number of talented colleagues who have built a very large scale, diverse, procedurally generated world for us to train our models to drive in. One of the things that's important to realize is that many approaches to simulation and self-driving today focus on validation, either for re-simulation approaches to understand what would have happened uh, from log data in different scenarios, or to validate existing algorithms that are maybe hand-tuned or trained offline. What we've built is a simulator that's from the ground up designed for training. It's procedurally generated and with a different random seed can create a completely different 3D world with different um, skins, different street furniture, different road layouts, all completely random. And this diversity is, is really important for training. Uh, I think it's important to note that, that we don't believe photorealism is really, uh, really important. I think uh, there's a lot of very strong evidence that generative models are able to match the distributions between um, simulated, uh, simulated visual space and the actual real world visual uh, visual manifold. And so I'd ra much rather rely on a generative model than on hand coding a photorealistic simulator to solve that problem. But the diversity is really crucial and, and that's what uh, I'm showing here. But what's the ultimate test for a, a driving model? And what's the ultimate test for its ability to generalize? Well, I still don't think these tests are enough. What I think we really need to see is, can we generalize to a new unseen test city? And can the representation that we've constructed actually learn to drive in a general sense. If we learn to drive through a traffic light in one domain, I don't have to keep doing that for every single uh, traffic light domain in the world. It'd be great to learn an intelligence that can actually understand them in general and scale to many domains. And this is very challenging for um, solutions that require hand-coded rules or HD maps because they scale linearly, ordering to new, new geographic distributions. So on the, on the right, uh, let me go back. On the right, you can see our, uh, this is the data we've collected in London, and although it's very diverse and almost exhaustive around the city, uh, it's still not a true test of generalization. And so really I wanna see if we can go to a new city. And one of the things that I'm super excited to, to share with you all today is, uh, is something our team achieved this year, and that's 
being able to generalize to a novel city. We took an approach, uh, an algorithm that was trained on purely London training data, and we trained it to, to drive and then took it to a completely novel to city. This, uh, in this instance, we went to Cambridge, which is about an hour and a half or 100 kilometers or so drive north of London. And in this video, you'll see our system driving autonomously in Cambridge on roads it's genuinely never seen before during training. And this is true zero shot domain transfer. Um, you know, we've seen, we've seen self-driving generalized to highway scenarios around the world, but to be able to generalize to new urban scenarios uh, like this, I think is super exciting. And the thing that we were really pleased to see is the, the test metrics that we get in Cambridge were, were very comparable and very similar to what we see in London. Uh, so I think this is the true test for intelligence and driving is how can you generalize to, to novel domains. In the final section of this talk, I'm going to move on to talking about uh, how we can make our learning more data efficient and in particular, how we can leverage computer vision and uh, structured inductive biases in our models in, in perception and future prediction to learn more efficiently. Uh, and I'm going to focus on two papers that we've published, uh, the first one on urban driving with conditional limitation learning, and secondly, on a, a new one on future prediction. So I said before that our driving, uh, end to end driving model must learn a mapping from a, a 10 to the power of eight dimensional input to a 10 to the power of one dimensional output. And, and I really think these two ideas are critical to be doing this efficiently, as learning just from the action representation signal alone will be uh, quite, uh, quite inefficient, most likely. So the first approach uh, is, is something we took last year in our work on urban driving with conditional limitation learning. It's taking camera input or visual input from the, uh, from the car, encoding it through perception encoders, and then concatenating, concatenating that representation before feeding to a policy model. And this is trained end to end. But of course, we decode through a more classical encoder decoder model in computer vision to a number of intermediate states, semantics and semantic segmentation, optical flow for motion, and monocular depth for geometry. Now there's a lot of numbers here, but I can point out the difference between um, doing a purely end-to-end -end model and bringing in perception states or even perceptions and perception and flow, um, you can see that the performance in meters per intervention uh, goes up drastically. So what we found here is that with our limited training data and in this uh, small scale testing, that adding in computer vision representations massively improves the data efficiency of our learning. And I think that's really because um, because it really improves our ability to generalize due to appearance change. We can leverage the kind of data and invariances that we've been working on in computer vision for many decades. It also disentangles the representation. And what I mean by that is that we're able to use a more compressed and lower dimensional and orthogonal intermediate representation that makes policy learning a lot more data efficient. And then finally, it gives us an, an interpretable view on these uh, intermediate um, states so we can actually understand what the car is perhaps thinking. And going back to our graph of autonomy, uh, we were very pleased to see a very positive response. Even, you know, even at the small scale testing we did a year ago, we were pleased to see a very positive response with performance metrics with regards to data. And that's really what we're after in these methods. How can we scale efficiently with data? So finally, uh, to talk about future prediction, which uh, you know, I agree is, is really, I think, the hardest outstanding problem uh, in the perception stack for self-driving. So let's consider the scene. This is a car driving up to an intersection and without, uh, you know, with only access to this information that we can observe in the world, it's fair to say that there are multiple futures that could eventuate. We could turn left, we could turn right, we could drive straight. The future is inherently un un uh, uncertain, you know, given the, the knowledge that we currently understand. Um, at least that's the way that the world works um, as far as I understand it. I, I think that, uh, you know, it's up to physicists to debate whether the world is deterministic or not. But given our observability over the past, it's, it's certainly, um, you know, certainly we need to draw a distribution over the future. So what we've done is, is designed a model that's able to learn and model those multimodal distributions. So here you can see us projecting our future prediction model into the future. And you can see with three different samples from this model, we're able to predict a turning left, a straight, or a turning right uh, scenario. And this model is able to understand the multimodality of that data. And so in this work, um, the novel contributions are really uh, producing this multimodal model that's probabilistically able to model the future, both diverse and plausible futures. And why this is really hard for driving, because we've seen uh, some, some work in the past on multimodal generative modeling in, uh, in, for example, medical imaging. But in these domains, you get for a single input data, let's say a radiography 
a, a radiologist's image. You might have multiple experts labeling something like a tumor. And then so you have an, an, an explicit mapping from a single input to multimodal distribution of outputs. But in driving, of course, we can only ever observe one future. And so this makes this a very hard problem to learn. So here's how we did it. We take a sequence of frames and code it into a perception state X and then run it through a um, autoregressive uh, 3D convolutional dynamics model to give us our dynamic state Z. Now the naive thing to do would be to unroll Z into the future in a deterministic sense with an R and N and then decode it to our states of semantics, motion and geometry. But the problem with this is that because the future is so, you know, uh, is so multimodal and driving, this ends up collapsing to a trivial solution of, of just basically moving the ego car forward and not at all performing very well. So to deal with that, what we do is we've introduced what we call the future and present distributions. The future distribution is able to understand the um, privileged information at training time that we see in the future. And this is important because it can actually understand this distribution and guide our model to project, project into the future at not just the plausible future, but the one that corresponds to our training data. And this allows us to actually um, give a regression loss between that future prediction and the actual future training data. So that we're predicting not just the plausible, but the right uh, future for this example. But then of course, at, uh, at test time, we don't have access to the future. So we also train a present distribution conditioned only on the past states. Uh, and we train this through a divergence loss to match the future prediction. And then at test time, we can sample from this and generate these multimodal futures that, that I'm about to show you. Most crucially, we can pass this representation to control, allowing us to, uh, to really benefit from this explicit knowledge of the future. And so here's, here's some results that you can see our model is able to, um, uh, like I showed before, understand to move left, right, straight in this intersection. But if we advance a bit in the future so that we're actually starting to do a left turn, you can see that all the futures converge on a left turn. And this is important. Again, I'll come back to the, the, the importance of generating plausible futures. Uh, we can also predict dynamic agents. So here you can see the prediction of, of cars moving in a row in semantics, motion, and geometry. Um, and even, I think this one's very interesting looking at unprotected right turn. So here, there are some very interesting multi-agent uh, interactions, whether we wait for the cars in front or if we nudge them, immediately turn right or even go straight. And uh, I think this kind of level of understanding has been hugely important uh, to, to Im improve our control system. And further, here's some multi-agent interactions. So here you can see how our vehicle behaves if the car in front of us pulls away or stays stationary in our, in our lane, and we might uh, behave differently. And some initial result on pedestrians, you can see on the left is a pedestrian that walks behind and, included, uh, and is occluded by a lamppost. And on the right, there's one crossing the road. But I think it's very fair to say that this work is, is very initial and we need to improve our instance representations. But you know, as a start, to be able to jointly model um, our ego car, other vehicles and the static scene in a generative sense, I think this is a real enabler for driving representations. And in terms of metrics, well, we see a, a massive performance improvement, uh, about 20% when we bring in a probabilistic future encoder compared to 13% of the deterministic one from a computer vision sense. And then actually in terms of the driving policy, uh, we see a large improvement in both speed and steering regression uh, uh, compared to a non-future prediction aware model. So finally, uh, let, let me conclude this material and I want to, to share, I guess, some thoughts on, on why this is really pertinent and, and why, uh, why I hope that these ideas are, are, are picked up by, by more people, because I really do think that what's going to enable, um, enable intelligent and safe autonomy at scale for society. Well, at WAVE, our goal is, is this ambitious paradigm shift for AVs. I think we, we really need to move away from trying to race to get something work in a constrained environment that is never going to be economically viable. Maybe it will in affluent areas like uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. But you know, we're going all in on developing an end-to-end -end learning system that can learn very efficiently and won't just be the first to one city, but really we want to be the first to 100 cities. And there's a big difference between having, uh, I think, a couple of research scientists and an intern work on this project versus having your whole company behind this effort from everything from the data infrastructure to the compute infrastructure, the vehicle platforms, um, to you know, us living and breathing end-to-end -end autonomy. And uh, that's what I've been really delighted to share with you today. Um, so a big thanks to all of the, the really talented colleagues that I, I feel very lucky with to work with each day. Um, if you have any questions, do shout out. Uh, feel free to, to drop me an email. I'll be happy to reply. 
And of course, if, if you're excited by this mission as we are, um, please shoot us an email because we've always got positions open for talented and exceptional people um, like yourself. So thank you very much. And I'll, I'll end there. Cheers.